we are very grateful to have this opportunity for persons to again join us for another broadcast live here with Virgin Islands Caribbean Culture Notes here with WVI Radio 97.3 FM and streaming at wvi.uvi.edu. This gives us an opportunity to really add to yet again another shout out for International Men's Day amongst other observances that are happening globally to recognize the achievements, the contributions of our brothers, our uncles, our sons, our grandsons, our husbands, our fathers, and beyond. And we have the joy and privilege of being joined this afternoon with the illustrious, very engaging academic, yes, activist, yes, powerhouse in terms of research, one of the most read research scholars in the 48 and probably a little further than the 48 US, the Honorable Dr. Llewellyn Cornelius, who is a distinguished professor at the University of Georgia in Athens. I'm gonna pause there so we can just go, ooh, who's he? Right, so thank you so much, Dr. Cornelius. Well, and Dr. Chen, you could say been there, done that, because you was up here of all times just before the COVID thing went down. Isn't that how peculiar, right? Oh, how peculiar. That like, is, at the edge of time. Yeah. You, in other words, your timing was impeccable. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. When I think about it, like, wow. Well, invitation, it was, got a chance to see. We did a lot. You had, yeah, yeah. I must let the viewing and listening audience know. We worked from the morning to the evening. And we were doing things, teaching classes, working with students, navigating with scholars, going to program after school programs, going to the Chamber of Commerce. You had me radio stations. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Well, you know, it's like as you you know, I grew up in New York City. And so like when you come in Manhattan, uh -huh. it's like you speak when you're dead. You know, you don't worry about getting any rest while you're here. And that's I was like, no, 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 you don't need no sleep. It's voluntary. No, no. You don't need that. Come on, let's go. I'm coming by. I'm, coming by. I'm blowing a horn out in the parking lot. All right, let's go. Let's go. Make it happen. Make it happen. It's time for you to roll. <laughs> it's like time, you know. So I, I'm very thankful that, you know, and I want to make sure that persons that may not be as familiar, you know, you are, have ties, you know, ancestral legacy ties to the Virgin Islands right here on II St. Croix. And in addition to that, you know, I stopped at Professor distinguished and I want to be very specific. Very, very specific. Guess, guess your phone works, doesn't it? It does work. And yeah. it's loud. But it's all good. We're gonna make that yeah. we're gonna that out right now. But ideally you know, that Dr. Llewellyn Jake Cornelius, you know, works at the School of Social Work at the University of Georgia. And in addition to being a professor, he is a Donald L. Hollowell distinguished professor of social justice and civil rights studies, the director of the Center for Social Justice, Human and Civil Rights, and also the director of the Caribbean Studies Abroad Program. So that's the other layer. And I must add, he has been so kind to serve on the BICCC's Advisory Council as an ambassador and just bringing his skills, talents, and expertise to the work that's being done, the collaborations that have come forth, as well as research fund development and much more. So that's the other reason why we're very grateful to have you join us, you know, on this International Men's Day, but also to talk about some of these conversations of what's really happening with social justice and like, who are all of these great people that like popped up, propped up and are doing this work and sometimes overlooking or many times overlooking the seasoned scholars, practitioners, cultural tradition stewards, the Rio, and the grassroots persons that know this work. So I will leave it there with you. Well, um, let me, and I make sure I turn, turn off the ringers for my, my email. I hope I did. Um, thank you, Dr. Jinzir, for allowing me yet again to be with my brothers and sisters and sisterettes and brotherettes in, in the Caribbean basin. And when we chatted, I um, shared with you that I actually have a, a, a very nice topic to bond with us on. And 
actually the background of this and part of this is like, you know, keeping Dr. Chenzira in trouble. Um, and one of my hats, I'm um, the editor in chief of the Journal in Poverty and they had a call for papers out for a special issue on environmental justice amongst indigenous persons from the Arctic Circle down to the bottom of Chile. Mm -hmm. And I've been um, pestering Dr. Chinzera and her colleagues in the Caribbean Basin to um, <clears throat> contribute to, to that, that piece. And, and I say that because that's actually gonna be a door opener for my talking about um, indigenous uh, justice issues. You may recall, <clears throat> this is the middle of November and we're in the beginning of, let's say a good two month cycle. We're all around the world. We celebrate um, families in their spiritual and cultural traditions. And that includes things for our brothers and sisters where the original Eve is from. And I'm a pause because I'm gonna leave you all to figure out what I meant when I said that. <clears throat> and then I'm actually gonna go and talk directly about the notion of First Nations, because the last Thursday in November in, in North America, we talk about Thanksgiving and you hear references to American Indians and Native Americans. And I'm actually gonna come around to that in another way. You hear typically um, a lot of times in, in Canada, in Central America, in Latin America, the reference to the term First Nations or indigenous people. And the reason for that is that it honors a presence in this part of the world before the Colombian expedition and the power of naming and the power of these groups to name their own journey and, desti and, and destiny. So when we say North America and South America, we have to deal with the name America Vespucci and how America was named after that. Or if we use the word Indian, we have to deal with how populations who weren't quote Indian because they weren't from South Asia, um, were in fact by the names of their tribal groups. And so when we even talk about indigenous populations, we deal with, in essence, a legacy that actually goes back 25,000 years in this part of the world. And it actually begins with the, the Baringa tribe in the Bering Straits were the first known First Nations that crossed over into what became Canada, North America, Central America, and South America. And a lot of the principles that they use are the, and I'm going to say this now and then say it at the end of my remarks. It's sort of like, wow, look at a lost opportunity. And the lost opportunity was a lot of the principles that you hear from indigenous nations were things that we walked away from at, at, at the beginning of the Columbian expedition. And what were those principles? The idea of, of collectivism, the respect for the earth, our natural spirits, working in collectivity, things of that sort, um, things, um, thinking not of earth as property, but our relationship to the ground and around that. As a matter of fact, you hear about the 360 degree concept of honoring all the things that are within the four winds, north, south, east, and west, the celestial up to the sky and down into the earth. And for that was a holistic expression of asking us to respect and honor everything that's living, insects, animals, plants. It was a whole spiritual collective presence, which is a, it's a paradigm that, that if you allow yourself to be open to that, can connect with other contemporary spiritual forms. Yet when you, when you start with that of being 25,000 years ago, what they were saying is how can we talk about us selling you some land and giving you title to it? Because in essence, the land belongs to us and we belong to it. Very fundamental different uh, um, constellation. And you can see this reflected in the Aztec nation, Inca nation, the Maya civilization, the Hopi um, nation in the Southwest, just as a, 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 a quick example. It's, it's that concept of balance. And I, I just want to say up front that their paradigm is the opposite of B 
be an ego, a self-centered right. individualism, land yeah. of contract and oppression. I'm going to stop there before continuing because I got a feeling for Dr. Chinzera is, is, is one into um, parallel and dubtail and, 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 you know, vibe. Did I get that right? You got it right. You got it right. What, I, what I'm hearing and what I'm feeling from the whole conversation, and I'm very grateful that you put it in that context, is this is a great time as we're doing this family gathering and giving of thanks for all things and recognizing the harvest and so forth, that this is a time where we have to be, are encouraged to be in that holistic frame of respecting all living things respecting all living things, human life, animal life, plant life, mineral life, all, all living things. And this gives us an opportunity and I appreciate that you framed the indigenous terminology so that we didn't just use the America term or the Indian term, even though even here, you know, we recognize this is a month that nationally is honored as National Native American Heritage Month, and here in II Virgin Islands, it is the in its extension, it is regarded as Native, Indigenous, Amerindian Heritage Month, and so there's a there's a whole co- vibration that comes with that because we are to start to use here. We do know some of the terms when we speak of the Taino, when we speak of the Kalinago or the Kalina and we move further south into the Kiskeya, or we speak of the Garifuna, and we can go on and on and on. We've been very fortunate to learn about the names of some of these spaces, I, I being what St. Croix and these neighboring isles around St. Croix were regarded as, because it was lands of rivers. And you know, there's a lot, and some people refer to the crossroad vibration, but that came a little later, right? And so you, you gave a very good segue into that discourse. So thank you for sharing that. And please, you know, expound a little more. Thank you, Dr. Cornelius. And I'll make sure I, I come back to, to the indigenous um, nations in the Caribbean basin before we're finished. Actually, before I do that, because I'm actually going to, um, two things. There is a fantastic series that was on PBS called Native Americans. And it's, I think, like a five, six part series. It is beautiful and deep and poetic. A lot of the, you know, uh, I remember after watching it, taking very extensive journal notes about that because it was like, wow, you really have to rethink the paradigm right. of, of our, our journey here. Now, and along those lines, you, you're starting to hear some people uh, use the phrase anti-colonialism. And, and if we connect it to this indigenous discussion, you know, here's a reality. None of this land belongs to us. Not a single square inch of earth from the Arctic Circle down to Chile belongs to us. If it belonged to anyone, it belonged to the First Nations. So, so that's one thing. The second thing, when you talk about anti-colonialism, it gets back to the self-determinant and rights of people to name themselves and their destiny. And part of one of the language things is starting to happen, and you're hearing this, um, like when we're talking about um, Latinx and, and Latinos in Latin America, you will have some folks that say, no, I'm, I'm Inca. I'm, I'm not Latin because therefore Latin again for the same naming thing tied to what? Hispanics and da, 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 da. So usually when I'm in that space, I say to folks, you got to let the population name for who, who, who they are in that context. Now, what I'd like to do to, is to shift to an, another part of this discussion um, in terms of the indigenous um, population was actually one of them. And, and like I said, I, I give credit to the PBS series on, on Native Americans for just like blowing my mind in so many ways. I'm actually gonna talk about uh, the, what in contemporary terms we call the Iroquois Confederacy, but back in 1100 AD, it was called the Ho de No Shone. And that was a confederacy of five and then six nations. The Mohawk, the Oneida, the Onondaga, the Cayuga, the Seneca, and then the Tuscarnona. Now, 
as it turns out, I went to college in Syracuse, which happens to be right where the Onondaga nation was. So as soon as they said, I'm like, oh, snap, there's all these nations up here between there and the Adirondacks. Yeah. Now, why, are, why is this nation, why is this Confederacy so important? Well, because in 1100 AD, they had a notion of governance uh, across the six nations that, are you ready? Are y'all listening? Are you with me? They became the basis for the way we developed the what U.S. Constitution. Constitution. <laughs> okay, so Airport. let me let me break that down in case any of y'all were asleep. So here we go. There are three concepts. One was called the the Council of Chiefs, which is the same as the U.S. Congress, what they call the Council of Chiefs, and then the second was the Chief of Chiefs, which is what we call the presidency, and then there was the clan mother, who is the equivalent of the Supreme Court justice. And there's actually some writings that they tell you about in the PBS series about how after the Constitution was written that they were given credit for those concepts that they use, you know, that the writers of the Constitution used in developing the U.S. Constitution. Now, of course, they didn't give them credit for that when the Constitution was developed, I'm just saying. Yet here it is, we talk about the Colombian expedition and things of that sort. And we had indigenous people that is in what is now New York State, um, developed that 600 years, right? Before we called ourselves this constitution that we are so proud of and we tell everybody about. Now, while I'm at that, there's actually a couple other interesting concepts that they, that they really talk about one of them gets into when they talk about the earth, remember we talked about the earth before, they talked about it both figuratively in terms of uh, the synchronicity of crops. And at the same time, they talked about the way the earth grows to, to share the essence of communal life and representation and protection for each other. So they, the essence of what they are, and when, even when you go to their website and they talk about how they, they have their own spirit, spiritual presence, yes. it's interesting, they respect the spirituality of any other nation. So they didn't see a conflict between all the stuff that they talked about with the respect for the earth, civil, civil governance, with the of living and let live. Yeah, I thought it was important to talk about that simply because it was such a fascinating example in terms of the pre-Columbian space of how indigenous communities had civil governance. And the reason for that is that you see too many of these movies which create the notion of First Nations as being savages and stuff like that. Yet strange enough, out of these nations, we take the form of governance that we're so proud to talk about. Exactly. I mean, that's why I wanted to make sure that I showed some persons here a little bit of what, you know, what was the Native America series that you were referencing so eloquently because some persons may not remember. So if you even go just to PBS, you know, www.pbs.org, and you can just put in Native Dash America, and it'll send you to that very, you know, engaging website so that you can see for yourself, you know, a little bit more of what Dr. Cornelius, you know, is, has, has shared with us. I'm, as a matter of fact, I'm going to show this part just so that persons can just kind of see, you know, this is what we're talking about, you know, where they're talking about from caves to cosmos and, and sharing more about 15,000 year old questions, who were America's first people? You know, this is a wonderful good nature to nations you know, so you can actually understand the monarchies and the democracies, you know, the indigenous persons, cities of the sky, and some of the cosmological sites that most persons, you know, run to and get certain energetics from. And then, of course, the new world rising to really have those conversations and seeing some discourse and research around the resistance, the survival, and the revival that's, you know, being uncovered. You know, just so that people know, and again, you can just go to pbs.org and then forward slash to native-america. So thank you. Please, please continue because this is, this is very informative. Thank you, Dr. Cornelius. So um, a quick thing uh, just to go back, back to the series, and then I just want to 
wrap up the comments to segue into what uh, you were talking about with First Nations in the Caribbean Basin. Um, one, of this, one of those great episodes talks about the indigenous peoples who lived on the land that is now Mexico City. And what you end up, what you end up dealing with is civilizations that go back such a long time before the Spanish Inquisition and the way they use divide and conquer to have the native peoples fight against each other. And then strange enough, you have the, one of the largest cities in the world just built on top of an area where you've had civilizations before that. So a lot of this is, is just to help people understand that if, if you're gonna you know, cut that little turkey and slice that cranberry sauce, and you say you want to give thanks, you may want to extend it from the concept of giving thanks to your family members and your friends to give them thanks, first of all, to the earth, mm -hmm. okay? Because it was out of this earth that we came and flow and give, and, and give thanks to all those persons in the 500 treaties that were broken um, here in, in the United States against native, uh, uh, native populations including populations who were exterminated, which takes me to the segue from my last little tidbit about the, um, the Arawak and the Taino and, and, and the Carib nations To and, and I love it how you talked about other indigenous communities in, in the Caribbean basin, yet that is a point, you know, that if you're gonna talk about the, um, like we know how the Tainos covered several of the islands, Cuba, which Haiti, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico. We know that the Carib came, came up from what is now South America. And we know the Arawaks was the sub-tribe of, of the Taino. So part of this is like, first of all, like where are these people today? Oh, exterminated. Yeah. You know, and 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 I've actually had that conversation with students in my class, and we talk about oppression. It's like, while you have oppression, discrimination, then and then there's the old mm, just the extermination. So you exterminate, you take the land, you take the property, you take the rights to everything, and then you take away their names. Oh no, I'm sorry. You do have their names, but you put them up on street signs. Um, yeah, so part of that is just that sobering thing that, I mean, like when you hear about the Taino, they, they had a complex la language system. They had a, a multiple three-tiered system of social class and governance. They had like other First Nations collectivity and, and the extended family as a way of thinking and belonging. So any of these concepts of thinking that First Nations were uncivilized, you, get, you have to snap yourself out of that thinking. Um, and then finally, you know, there's a book I always say to folk, is the Zen book, The People's History of the United States, which is a book that writes about his and her story from the point of view of consumers and people, that part of what we may have to do is take that big old eraser and just erase what we thought we were taught in school and then relearn that. And one of the fascinating things about the internet is that a lot of this stuff is, stuff is out there. You know, you could, you could find this stuff. I mean, it's not that hard. So, um, you know, we owe it to ourselves and, you know, we owe it to those spirits from those who died uh, uh, on behalf of preserving uh, the, the nation. So I, those, I just ahead. wanted to make my little segue. There is a Zen education project teaching people's history. And it allows you to get different lessons that are linked to a people's history of the United States that does go from 1492 to present, present then being, you know, um, into the 20th, early part of the 20th, the middle of the 20th century. And I think- well, you, I've heard my remarks, so it's it's back to you, the uh, show host and all that kind of stuff. No, no, I just want persons to just know that it's important that when we when when you hear Dr. Cornelius make these references to these materials, a lot of the materials you can easily find by going on the internet, as he said, and keeping in mind that this was originally published in 1980. I can remember this being required reading in my in my years at Rutgers so at Rutgers University and it was a different approach to how we looked at American history because before that it was only what the ruling class said and only what the Federalist Papers documented and the founding fathers and that was it so this gives us an opportunity to really understand from the people's perspective 
from the grassroots perspective, from the common human's perspective, what was taking place parallel from 1492 coming up to you know, the latter part of the 20th century and just desired to, to share that. And when you were making your uh, commentary about the, about the Thanksgiving, I wanna show something that's like literally one minute in 43 seconds. It's really, really short. I felt that this would also, and it's coming from young indigenous women. And I felt that this might give a little bit of a, a snapshot of how people may begin to look at this space that we call, and, and I, I wanna make sure that I do everything first. Just check out that it's the real history behind Thanksgiving. And I'm coming back because I want to make sure that I have everything intact so that it will give us these, you know, when we when we do these things, that you can hear it clearly. Because sometimes we do have some hearing issues, and I'm trying to avoid <laughs> avoid that because I just want persons to watch and see their actions, see their attitudes, and what is really brought forth, right? Growing up, I knew that what they told you in school about Thanksgiving wasn't true. That's not the true story. The true story behind Thanksgiving was after every killing of a whole village, these European settlers celebrated it and they called it Thanksgiving. But it wasn't until Abraham Lincoln became president that it became an official holiday. He ordered 38 Dakota men to be hung for war crimes after the sacred holiday Christmas. We take this time to remember our elders who lost their lives due to what really happened. Usually my mom makes a Native American dish for us and we pray. Growing up, I would be kind of annoyed that they didn't know what actually happened on Thanksgiving and that they're actually celebrating the deaths of many people and many tribes that were lost. Whether it's to give thanks or to be with your family, you should learn how to holiday was established in the first place. I'm thankful for being born indigenous to this continent. I'm thankful that I still have my culture. I'm thankful that my elders kept our culture alive all these years. I'm thankful to be indigenous, resilient, and alive. I'm thankful for us all to be able to stand together, stand strong, and stand as one. Happy Thanksgiving, America. <laughs> Very powerful. Just saying. And that, that was very powerful. I thought when the first time that we saw that, we were so touched because I really didn't have the one hour and 15 minute lecture to explain that to my students yeah. because they just thought that I just was hating on a particular holiday. And you know, we have, you know, we have all kinds of materials that we can pull on, whether it's, you know, Dr. Barashango's African people's European holidays. We've had a lot of persons, you know, that have shared on this, you know, uh, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, Dr. Jacob Carruthers, Dr. John Henry Clark, many persons that were giving us the, that perspective very eloquently and very giving us the context. You know, we had brothers and sisters in the American Indian movement that were very instrumental to helping us understand that conversation, but to hear it from young indigenous women and to see it so simplistic yet powerful, I felt, you know, that's like the standard that I share out with them right before so that they just have it in their mindset so they understand. We give thanks. We, you know, we have a way of sanitizing a lot of things and making it nice or just that the context should be should be shared. So I, I really would love for you to weigh in on what 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 you just seen and some of the other works that you were going to share with our viewers and our listeners. Are you referring to me or are you referring to yourself? I'm you. <laughs> you know, I appreciate the, the you know again the whole thing about ownership and self determination by explaining you know the 200 years before um, President Lincoln what was happening. You know, because it, it was like the curious thing, well, exactly how did we get to this holiday? And what were we given thanks for? And we create this whole storyline separate from that about, you know, what the pilgrims did up in, in, in the Northeastern United States and so on. 
yet it just doesn't talk about the death that the First Nations sisters were referring to. You know, yeah. And, and I think the issue becomes for us is sort of like, you maybe the recast is the extent to which we have meaning for gratitude as opposed to yet another commercial thing where we're selling something and we have a Black Friday, which is now we go and we want you to buy stuff. You know, it's like, if you're really grateful, you know, it's like someone told me, you know, think about how Lester Holt ends his show about how we should care for ourselves and care for others. If we are grateful, how do we show our gratitude and thanks every day? Not just on the last Thursday or on December 25th. And that is the bigger issue. If we want to like you know, move from the to darkness into light, just show humility and gratitude. And if we do that, then we're going back to those original principles that you shared from the very beginning in terms of all, all the, you know, the freedoms, the holistic respect for all living things, that's gonna resonate with me. Right. So, you know, that means that we're gonna to need to shift from this very consumerism-driven humanity that we think is normal. And that's something that has transformed because it requires compassion, it requires patience, it requires respect, and it definitely requires a humility and an honoring of the environment. So I know that you have your schedule. We could do this for another hour. A thousand years, <laughs> but you know, I'm James Brown, let's hit it and quit. You know? <laughs> I appreciate it. So please give us your, your, your closing statement. And thank you again, Dr. Cornelius, for just making time for us this afternoon. Next time, we'll make sure that we have our full hour. You know, just to ask everyone to share moments of joy and tenderness with each other. Give thanks for that. Give that. I love it. Share moments of joy, joy. and thanks. tenderness. Tenderness, that's the word I was getting, joy and tenderness. If we're, gonna, if we're typing. So thank you. We really look forward to you joining us again because we appreciate getting these tidbits of, and gems and treasures of information. We know that you have been a, a stalwart and a very good foundation keeper and supporter and formerly an advisory council ambassador of the Virgin Islands Caribbean Cultural Center nestled in the College of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences here at the University of the Virgin Islands, the only historically Black college and university in the Caribbean and a land-grant institution. On behalf of the BICCC, our BICC Notes broadcast made possible in part through the BICCC and WBI radio networks. We are very, very thankful and appreciative of you making time with us, Dr. Llewellyn Cornelius. And we- it's a <laughs> Go ahead. Until next time, and okay. thank you. It's been an honor. Yes, yeah, so we're looking forward, and we'll keep chatting. Remember, love, love heals humanity. Land is our foundation, and spiritual harmony unifies us. Let's remember that, and we look forward to everyone doing their part to keeping Virgin Island Caribbean culture alive. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Thank you.